academic performance does not equate to what you can actually contribute to society. So don't feel the pressure of uh, uh, of having to, you know, kind of, if you're not excelling in, in academics, you're not going to be able to contribute to, to, to society. I think that's one. And I think the other would be, there is no substitute for hard work. Like you have to get up every morning. You have to figure out how can you help solve somebody else's mm-hmm. problem. It's not about how can I send up this email? How can I create this PowerPoint? Or how can I create this uh, Excel spreadsheet? From my perspective, it is about who is going to be impacted and what are they going to get out of it? Welcome to the Risk Never Sleeps podcast in which we learn about the people that are on the front lines delivering and protecting patient care. I'm Ed Gaudet, the host of our program, and I am pleased today to be joined by Manan Kakar, AVP of Cybersecurity for Providence. Welcome, sir. How are you? Thanks. Thanks for having me, Ed. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, How's the weather in Seattle? uh, The weather is, it looks nice. Like everybody says that Seattle is pretty gloomy. I look out of the window, I see a little bit of sun. It was snowing yesterday a little bit. We had some hail a little bit. Oh no. Um the the forecast for the weekend seems like it's going to be cold. So at least in downtown Seattle I can see sun which is into what a lot of people associate with Seattle. I I I spent a lot of time working with Microsoft and I was always surprised every time I would go out there it was always nice out and I'm like all right this is the trick. They don't want you to be out here. That's why you tell it's like Ireland, right? Ireland supposedly rains all the time every time I go it's beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> Um, so let's start off with, um, you know, describe to our listeners a little more about your organization and your current role. Yeah, absolutely. So Manan Kakar, I'm part of the Providence cybersecurity team. Providence is a fairly large healthcare provider here, primarily focused on the West Coast, a little bit uh, in Texas and some of the other states. We have about over 120 caregivers and we have more than 50 hospitals and over a thousand clinics that we have within our portfolio. And we also have a university, uh, Providence University. So it's a pretty complex uh, landscape that we have, primarily a healthcare provider. My role in the Providence cybersecurity team is I lead the the overall strategy, the budget, how do we we execute against our strategy? So the program management aspects of it. So I've got a fairly decent team that does M&A cybersecurity. We focus on strategy. And in terms of uh, the the topic at hand, uh, the risk, I think any cybersecurity strategy or any business strategy has to factor in risk. So we we have a very methodical approach to figuring out when we say we are doing cybersecurity strategy, when we do planning, so on and so forth. Risk is always the the core component of the discussion. A risk based strategy is uh, is something that we all strive for within the industry. And uh, at Providence, we have teams that focus on that, and that's part of my team's uh, portfolio. Excellent, excellent. How did you get into healthcare and, and cyber? So it's it's been an interesting journey. I was uh, in consulting for almost uh, almost a decade, and I worked with public sector companies. I worked in the private sector clients, and I had clients across from a a company that leases rail cars to to financial uh, to healthcare to to defense contractors across the board. And as part of this journey, uh, obviously, you know, being in consulting, you you get to work with a variety of clients. Healthcare was a a set of clients that I worked quite a lot with. And uh, one of my former clients uh, ended up joining Providence as the CISO, Adam Zoller. And we continue to stay in touch. And he said that, hey, do you want to kind of uh, build all the cool things that you presented to me as a consultant? You want to come over and help build those? It sounded like a great opportunity. We were in the middle of COVID, so travel and consulting wasn't happening. Things were changing. The landscape was changing. Felt like an interesting opportunity to to do something new, uh, build something fresh within the industry, not just on the outside trying to figure out why we can't make things happen, but truly own functions and say, how can I make a difference? And Providence being a a, a mission-driven organization, it a lot of it resonated with me. Uh, COVID was uh, was happening. There was a lot happening, and then I was like, "Is there something I can even even in my small way, if I can contribute to the better uh, betterment of society through healthcare? I'd love that opportunity to see how it goes." So that's I how I ended that. up here. Yeah, no, and I love you brought up the mission, the shared mission that is pretty unique to healthcare. 
Yeah. And, um, and, uh, I think that's what keeps us all coming back to healthcare because you can't get it in any other industry. Yeah. It's, uh, it's something that I, I, I've seen that a lot of people gravitate towards, uh, and, uh, if if we think about you know the where Providence is, we are in in Seattle in the Washington State area. We've got the Amazon, Starbucks, Microsoft. We've got some Boeing. We've got some of the the biggest companies out there. And in terms of everybody knows within cybersecurity, talent is is a challenge. And how do you attract talent? How do you retain talent? How do you make sure that people are motivated uh, to to participate in the mission of an organization? I've seen across the board, people are like, hey, this is this is interesting. This resonates. And it's not just about, you know, the, the next promotion or, or you know, the, the other aspects that drive a lot of corporate culture. Um, so I've, I've seen a lot of positives and it's yeah. been uh, it's been a very rewarding journey. I love that. I love that. Um, as you look at the new year, what are your top three priorities uh, or strategic initiatives that you're looking at? Um, I think from a strategic mission perspective, what we've been focused on is the more we think about cybersecurity uh, within the healthcare space, there is a lot of appreciation and acknowledgement that we have a population that is more focused on how do we make sure that the population is is healthy. There is patient care and and improving the health of the the society that we operate in that's what providence is here for mm-hmm. so now when we when we think about hey what is the cybersecurity team going to do how do we reduce risk how do we think about maturing our capabilities i think it all starts with that mm-hmm. so when we start thinking about it from that lens then it then then things start to fall into perspectives like okay we have to make sure that there is frictionless authentication for our uh, clinicians how do we improve the experience of clinicians who whose job is not to figure out how what MFA token do I put in? Where do I get all that stuff? So yeah. then we start thinking. Then we start thinking about it from a clinician's perspective and the patient perspective. That our cybersecurity strategic initiatives should be geared towards how do we improve the user experience from a security aspect. Uh, so then we start thinking about okay, there is there is tech debt that prohibits us from launching new technologies. So how do we focus on tech debt and how do we refine our technologies that allow us to do some of these cool things that are like tap and go, frictionless authentication, biometric, uh, like facial recognition, Mm -hmm. thumbprint authentication, so on and so forth. So I think for us, when we start thinking about strategic priorities, we look at it from how do we impact our, our clinicians? How do we impact our patients in a positive way from security? And then we start working backwards. Oh, okay, we'll have to, you know, consolidate a bunch of domains. So identity management is uh, is managed because identity is where the bad guys come in from uh, and and take advantage of things. So okay, now let's figure out the risk. Now, if we want, if we are able to articulate the risk of identity on why we want to do very technical, very complex projects like domain consolidation in a way that it says that this allows us to make frictionless authentication possible, this allows us to reduce our risk landscape for lateral movement, then based on the audience, when we have these risk conversations, people are more interested in like, yes, I support this initiative. So that's how we started thinking about strategic initiatives uh, over the last uh, uh, two to three years at Providence, and it's been resonating. Um, So right now, I think for 2024 and 2025, our goals are to to improve our uh, uh, identity and authentication uh, capabilities so that it is easier for clinicians to mm-hmm. interact with complex security technologies like MFA. It's not that difficult. They don't have to have like 10 badges. And every yeah. time they're trying to to enter into a system, they have to figure out which badge do I have yeah. to use? So how do we reduce that footprint? Yeah. So I think a lot of us in technology are attracted to the, the cool things that technology allows us to do. Uh, at the same time, now we have a lot more appreciation for how do we communicate that, hey, if you want this school technology, these are the things that we have to do. This is how we get funding. This is how we get buy-in for change management. So mm-hmm. that's how we've it. been uh, operating. And those are the things that we're mm-hmm. looking at from a strategic perspective. No, I love that. I love how you connected it to the business too, which is so critical. And you've articulated that so well. And oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, I want to balance it. Well, you just you just said you're, you're, you're looking at it from the enablement lens first yeah. and then the enforcement lens afterwards and yeah. that balance is so critical yeah. to, to strike it's, 
it's it it's one of the things that i think the in, the cyber industry is is understanding and appreciating and that is our own maturity where we started from uh, the roots of cyber security are from audit like you know you have this audit you have to meet mm-hmm. this audit control requirement and do you meet this compliance requirement and now then it was like there was a phase where it was like hey we got to get in these cool tools implemented we have to do x y and z now we are coming from an industry perspective i see us maturing into a space where we are connecting the both and it's no longer like a hey, cyber is just a checkbox or cyber is just compliance or cyber is just a bunch of tools now we are actually thinking about user experience how to how to securely allow people to do what they have to do and let them focus on their job without having to worry about all these security restrictions we've seen in the past so yeah, no, you're, i think you're, it's it's you're spot us on. Yeah, and the way you say it, like across the business versus vertically within the context of just IT. So I love that yeah. distinction. Um, a lot of things happening, obviously, in your world. What keeps you up at night? I think this this is, uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, so there, there's a little bit of, I've, I've, I've had this question come up in a few different conversations, and it always gives me a moment to think about, like, you know, hey, what? Wh- is, is there something, obviously, one answer is that, you know, if we are well prepared, if we've gone through some testing, if we've, if we're starting to build a muscle memory around how are we going to respond to, to incidents, do we have the right model to detect, protect, and, and mitigate when things happen, then I see fine. Or like mm-hmm. I can sleep exactly. because there are we have put in the people process technology. Yeah. But at the same time, I think all of us in we, whoever is in the cyber field just has this knack of you know there is there's this one little spreadsheet that you know that one column is missing and you're like you know if I had this data <laughs> I could do X Y and Z and we could improve things. So yeah. I think from from what keeps me up at night, obviously you know just uh, thinking about it, the biomedical space that we have. We are a healthcare provider. Equipment of ours connects to patients, and God forbid if there is a ransomware that prevents that. Those kind of incidents um, are things that keep keep all of us at night, uh, keep all of us up at night. Um, and that's what we, when we wake up, we are like, hey, what can we do better? Um, how can we clean up our tech debt so that we don't have this situation? Oh, how do we think about third-party vendor ma- risk management? It's a huge area, um, you know, and 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 those are the things that not necessarily in the true sense, keep us up at night, but that's what, when we wake up, we are like, Hey, what can we do today to, to address this? What can we do today to think about this problem differently? So I think that's how I think about it. It's not like we, we are fortunate to have like a global SOC. We have teams in India Mm -hmm. that are working when we are, uh, we are resting. So literally there is no need for us to be up at night because we have a team and they'll reach out if something breaks. Uh, but at the same time, I think there's just this curiosity that cyber teams have and engineering mindsets have that, hey, what can we improve? And that's what gets us motivated to wake up the next day and be like, all right, what do we have? What can we do today? Different? Yeah, that's, that's how I think about this. Question. No, it's a really, really good answer. Um, tough couple of years for folks, given the pandemic. Um, over the last couple of years, what are you most personally or professionally proud of? Within Providence, I think we as an organization have gone through tremendous technological and digital change through the COVID era. Like, you know, we you'll, you'll hear our CIO and our executives talk about how we've improved our landscape for our single global ERP, single mm-hmm. largest footprint for single Epic and that those kind of things. So I think doing all of that while adapting to a remote environment, if, if I look at it singularly from the lens of like, hey, what has the, the technology teams, what what have we been able to do? One is driving such significant change that impacts people who are out there in the hospitals doing different things. We've been able to do that. Um, and in a short then, period of time, it sounds like, too. In, in a significantly short period of time. Yeah. Like from my consulting days, these things used to be three to five year roadmaps that we would create. Yeah. And Providence has been able to make those things happen in two years or less in some cases. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so that kind of stuff and just being part of that journey from a cybersecurity perspective uh, and seeing how we can try new things um, and, and deploy a global SOC, build a, a centralized program management, project management capability, all remote, like hiring 
an entire team of uh, people, about like 30-ish people, uh, fully remotely, them working remotely. And now when they come together in the office and they're like, hey, this is so great. It, it It's personally rewarding to see that we were able to do it. It, it felt daunting. It felt impossible. Uh, but we've been able to do it. And that has allowed us to now be in a position where we can start thinking about how do we introduce co-pilot? How do we introduce AI in our technologies? Now we are thinking about the security guardrails or around those things while some teams are thinking about what do we do with AI? You know, so so being able to do what we did within the COVID and, and the remote days and now being able to build upon that to adapt to where the industry is going, I think yeah. I, I feel uh, fortunate to be part of that journey. That's that's great. How, how about personally? Anything personally that? Um... Uh, personally, I think uh, I have a nine and a half month old. And <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Super proud of the fact that I can wake up and get him to daycare on time and then be on a team's call um, and, and still function. I think yeah. on the personal front, it's uh, it's been a huge accomplishment. Yeah. It, <laughs> yeah. Um, outside of healthcare and, and cyber, um, what are you most passionate about? What would you be doing if you weren't doing this? Uh, I I think if, uh, if I wasn't doing this, I would be somewhere in somewhere something to do with technology i've been a technology journalist i've been a technology podcaster all those kind of things uh, right now uh, building smart home capabilities is one of my favorite pastimes so i've ah. always like whenever i have some downtime either i'm playing on my new ps5 or i am tinkering with uh, some light bulb and my wife is like hey why is this not working <laughs> so but i think if, yeah. if it wasn't for healthcare, if it wasn't for cybersecurity, I'd still definitely be somewhere uh, within the technology space tinkering with something. I love that. Um, if you could go back in time and uh, tell your 20-year-old self anything, what would it be? Uh, I, I, I saw this question and it really <laughs> made me uh, take a pause. And I was like, this is interesting. I haven't thought about this. Uh, and, and so I had to think about like, what was that? What, what was on my mind when I was uh, 20? Where was <laughs> That's I? Right. Exactly. And I think uh, if if I was to do that, frankly, it would have been that academic performance does not equate to what you can actually contribute to society. So don't feel the pressure of uh, uh, of having to, you know, kind of, if you're not excelling in, in academics, you're not going to be able to contribute to, to, to society. I think that's one. And I think the other would be there is no substitute for hard work. Like you have to get up every morning. You have to figure out how can you help solve somebody else's mm -hmm. problem. It's not about how can I send up this email? How can I create this PowerPoint? Or how can I create this uh, Excel spreadsheet? From my perspective, it is about who is going to be impacted and what are they going to get out of it? So there is no substitute to doing the work of understanding what problem you're solving, who's being impacted and what do they get out of it? Um, I think that's something that I would try to tell myself when I was 20, because again, I was, uh, I didn't care about these things. I was like, Hey, I want to get this done. I'll do it. I don't, I wasn't thinking too much about, uh, yeah. others, yeah. but I think that's where we can make change. And that's, that, that's the pivot. I think that, uh, I would have loved to see if I could have made earlier. I love that. I love that. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you this question. This is the risk never sleeps podcast. What is the riskiest thing you've ever done? Uh, the riskiest thing, honestly, is uh, taking my younger brother uh, to Dubai with me and skydiving. <laughs> I love it. Finally, a skydiving response. <laughs> Tell so us about I, it. <laughs> I, I so there was this uh, there was this YouTube video of Will Smith that I watched uh, several years ago, where he was talking about how he got over his fear of skydiving. Mm -hmm. And how rewarding it was and i was flying back to to india i am from india so i was flying back to meet my family and i was like hey i, ha I can make a layover at dubai because the visa restrictions uh, are not that stringent i can get a tourist visa so a lot of logistical things were starting to come together so i asked my brother who was in india at the time is like hey do you want to come to dubai and uh, we'll go skydiving um and we were on the plane i wasn't I was all excited because there was going to be somebody else like talking about risk. This was calculated risk. I was like, I'm not going alone. I'm going to be tied to somebody who yeah, actually does this 
Yeah, yeah it's uh, somebody who knows what they're doing. So it's calculated <laughs> risk. Right. Uh, and it's not your how, brother. It's not yeah, your brother. <laughs> no, no, no. It was like a trained professional. Like I have one. My brother's got a trained professional. That's great. Jumping. Yeah. And halfway, when we were halfway to, to jump height, that's when I started to feel it. I was like, oh, crap. What did I sign up for? Oh, yeah. And my so the way it works is like uh, the, the jumper you're tied to, they'll hold you at the at the exit. And I, I vividly remember that my brother went before me and I, I saw him uh, with, uh, with his skydiver. They were there. And then in less than a second, they were not there. Wow. They jumped. Like yeah, that yeah, moment, yeah. That, that was scary. Like, what did I put my brother in? Like, ah. where is my brother? Like that, that moment. And then when I jumped, like the jump was fantastic. Loved every minute of the jump. And then yeah. when we got down, it was like, I don't know if I want to do this again. <laughs> I did once. I don't want to. I don't know if I yeah. want to do it again. But I so love that, that my... though. That moment just before you jump, all of a sudden, it's like this yeah. realization is like, what exactly? Am I, what am I doing? Exactly. Yeah, I exactly. That. That's that's terrific. Um, I, you know, occasionally I'll ask people about uh, passion for the arts or music or things, and I don't know if you got that question in advance, but. Uh, if you were on a desert island, any uh, specific albums or movies you'd bring with you? Um, yeah, I definitely take uh, Gladiator because it is a personally very motivating story and a movie. The original one, I know Love there's that. a remake. Yeah. Uh, so definitely Gladiator because I'm alone on an island. I need some something to motivate me. Uh, maybe Castaway because it might give me some tips and tricks on how I can uh, get off the island. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I don't know either either Jay Z or Coldplay, one of their oh, albums to That's good. Those are good yeah. choices. Yeah. So that would be my pick for three. That's good. I saw the. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the Fifty Cent movie where he. Uh, yeah, that's good. It's a good movie. Yeah. Was like my my wife my wife came upstairs last night. She's like, "Is that?" Are you playing 50 Cent? I'm like, yeah, I just, I just watched the movie. It was so good. I, I want to listen to some more music. But um, excellent. So um, last minute advice for anybody that's considering coming into healthcare and or cybersecurity? Um, I, I I would say curiosity. There are a lot of problems to be solved. Uh, there is There are a lot of changes happening in healthcare uh, as we speak. The, the models are changing. How do we provide care? It's no longer, the focus is no longer like, hey, people are going to come to this one building for all their care. We are trying to figure out how do we get to people where they are to provide them the care. So so the models are shifting. So how do we make that happen? Uh, th there's a lot of change there. Cybersecurity, everybody knows that there are new things that are happening every day. So I think if anybody is trying to come into any of those fields or in the middle of both of those fields, I would say, Curiosity and a willingness to be like, hey, how can I improve the processes and impact others in a positive way? I think that mindset and curiosity are my top uh, top considerations that I personally think about every every couple of months. Is like, what gets me excited? What problems would I love to solve? Excellent, there excellent. I love it. Excellent advice. And this is Ed Gaudet from the Risk Never Sleeps podcast. If you're on the front lines protecting patient safety and delivering patient care, remember to stay vigilant because risk never sleeps. Mm -hmm.